Center of Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda Educational and Research Institute, India, in this invited lecture series. Welcome, Vikram. Welcome, Nav. Uh, a few uh, words about Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda Educational and Research Institute, India. Uh, a few words about the invited lecture series. And now this invited lecture series intends to expand the horizon of innovation for our graduate students. And it's still in its infancy. We started the lecture series you know, a couple of months ago. The lectures are sometimes of general interest to the rural development and extension fraternity, but sometimes it focuses on specific research outcomes, which is obtained by using novel theoretical grounding or analytical approaches. And since there is no explicit funding provision for this initiative, we have been reaching out to our friends and known academicians who are working as faculty members, senior professionals in the development sectors, and graduate students of a premier higher educational institute. The idea is to create this city a periodic hub of knowledge sharing where scholars will be able to come and share their thoughts. Uh, the implication is that you can also come up with some proposals of talk and write to us for hosting the same. And upon the approval from our advisory board, uh, we can host your lectures also. Unfortunately, we have friends uh, like Vikram and Nob who readily agreed to deliver a joint talk as a part of this series. Uh, we are deeply indebted to them for this kind gesture and also, Vikram's suggestion to uh, adjust the role of evaluators in the extension system has definitely added value to this webinar. I, I remember Vikram pinging up on this issue several times during our personal discussions and silently how it is critical to the prospect and survival of extension specialists in the USA. Uh, we are particularly eager to hear his experience of evaluation in the UC system. Uh, also, an intuitive interest of this talk will be a comparative understanding of extension in the USA and India. Uh, in spite of fundamental differences in the context of extension in these two countries, there are elements of learning and innovation that uh, we can draw on. And I'm sure NAP's deliberation will sensitize the audience and uh, the issue of comparative analysis um, will inevitably emerge during the question and answer session. Now, given a rapid transformation expected in Indian agriculture, especially its enhanced preoccupation with integrated value chains and digitization, coupled with several policy reforms on the cards, we expect quite a few parallels in between the extension of the USA and India. And that is why uh, this talk may well transcend the description of US institutions and programs and provide us with the insights to contextualize it for our own system. And we'll eagerly wait to hear from the eminent speakers. Uh, a few housekeeping issues. Uh, the length of the talk will be of 40 to 45 minutes roughly. And after this introduction, Vikram and Nog will present for 20 minutes each. And this will be followed by a 30 to 45 minutes of question and answer session. We have already received several interesting questions and I'm sure uh, Vikram and Nav will be interested to respond to them. We have already emailed you that uh, we have received several hundred registrations from, from this talk uh, from different parts of the world. And uh, uh, that's why we waited for some more time to accommodate uh, the participants from uh, outside India. Anyway, uh, the mode of question and answer, uh, maybe you will type your questions in the text box privately to me, that is IRDM Faculty Center. And I will screen and moderate those questions and present to Nav and uh, Vikram. Uh, this will save some of our time and we will be able to take as many questions as possible during the question and answer sessions. So with this brief uh, introduction and, and uh, the modalities of the presentation, uh, I am handing the session over to Bikram and Nav. Uh, so Bikram, it's over to you. You may start your presentation now.
Now, can you put it in the presentation mode? Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Rupak Goswami, for inviting uh, us to your lecture series. Uh, we welcome all the participants. I see that there are people joining uh, from many different time zones. Thanks uh, for the interest uh, in this lecture. I will give a brief overview of the outline that we will follow today, and then Professor Rao Ghimire will start the lecture. The topic, as you see, we are going to cover today is the structure of uh, extension system in the United States and the role of evaluation specialists within uh, that uh, system. Um, the, I will tell what our current positions are, and we both will talk about our career paths uh, when we get to talking our parts. I am Vikram Kaundinya. I am a faculty member in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at University of California, Davis. I am an extension specialist at the other series uh, with professors in the faculty rank in the college. And my the other presenter today is Professor Nao Ghimire. He serves as the Associate Director of Extension and a Professor of Agricultural and Extension Education at the University of Idaho. So now uh, we'll talk about the structure of the extension system. He'll start this lecture with the talk for about 20 minutes, as Dr. Rupak just said. After that, I'll talk about the role of evaluation specialists in the extension system here in this country for about 20 minutes, and then uh, Rupak will moderate uh, the question answer session. So if we don't get to answering all the questions in the time that we have been allocated today, uh, you're always uh, very welcome to email either me or now, and we'll be sure to respond uh, to your questions. So the primary outcome we are expecting from today's lecture is for you all to gain a basic understanding of uh, the extension system in the United States and how uh, people, evaluation specialists like me, are positioned in the system, what we do. The other outcome we are hoping uh, is that this lecture uh, may open up a channel for students who are interested in pursuing uh, graduate studies in extension education, community development, and related fields here in the US. Now and I will be very happy to work with students one-on-one -on -one if they follow up with us and help with the admissions process. So uh, now, can you please take it on from here? Thank you so much, Dr. Kondanya and Dr. Rupa Goswami. I really appreciate the opportunity. Everybody can hear me. If you can hear me, please type one in your chat box. If you cannot hear me, type two. So it looks like everybody can hear. Vikram, can you hear me well? Okay, greatly appreciate. Thank you so much. Based on some of your questions, I thought to talk about a little bit, couple of minutes about my background and where I come from, how I end up here in the United States in the current job. So I was born and raised in Nepal in a small rural town. Then I completed my undergraduate degree, bachelor's degree in agriculture from Nepal master's degree in agriculture from University of Melbourne, Australia, and doctoral degree in agriculture extension education from Iowa State University in the United States. Bikram, Bikram and I met, Bikram and I met during our uh, educational degree in Iowa State. So, so far my career path is concerned, I started my job in 1989 as agricultural extension officer in Nepal. Then after I finished my doctoral degree in the United States at Ames University, Iowa State University at Ames, I joined the job as agricultural extension educator at University of Wisconsin Extension. So this job is designing and implementing the programs for farmers and then also evaluating the outcomes. Then I moved uh, with the promotion to county extension director. I was also doing side-by-side -side evaluation consultant for the University of Wisconsin Extension. And from the last four years, I have joined this job as associate director of extension and professor of agricultural and extension education at Iowa, uh, University of Idaho. When I started my career as a 
agriculture extension educator, what I did is I did various programs for the farmers. So I was designing and implementing the programs. Some of the examples of the programs are nutrient management for crop and livestock farmers, fresh market vegetable production for Amish growers, they are ethnic group here, and horticultural programs for urban audience. Then I also conducted research with the research scientist called extension specialist here in the United States. And the research was focused on nitrogen rates in corn, the maize crop, like in India. Then I also organized and conducted county fair. I'll talk about that later on. And some of the photo you see here, the brochure, the brochure and uh, the, some of the classes I taught. Uh, it is very important in the United States that we need to evaluate our program. So when I was an agriculture agent, I evaluated my programs and found that during my period of seven years working as agricultural extension agent or educator, 81 farmers with 36,000 acres of land saved about $800,000 in their nutrient cost. Similarly, the 126 Amish vegetable growers increased their yield from 10 to 25%. That comes to a net income of little over $400,000. Now, I'm going to the main topic that was given to me, the structure of the extension system in the United States. So extension in the United States is based on the learning and education system. It is the part of the university, especially the land-grant university. So the history of extension comes from the establishment of the land grant university. What is the land grant university? In 1862, there was a member of parliament in the central government that is called Senator from Vermont, the state of Vermont. His name was Justin Smith Morel. He filed a motion in front of the Congress upper house and lower house telling that we need to have a college for farmers, especially agricultural college to help the people of the United States. And he also requested that college should be in each state. Then Abraham Lincoln, the president donated 30,000 acres of government land to create the land grant university. And then the senator, was responsible to sell some part of the land and also raise some money to make the buildings. So with that, the 1862 land grant system was established. With the establishment of 1862, after 30 years, people realized that it is basically more focused on people with the white color. And then African-American, black people in this country raised the question that we need to have our one land grant university. Government granted that, and that is called 1890 land grant system. And after 100 years, in 1994, the Native American Indians in the United States, they said, we need a land grant university for us. That was 1994 land grant university under the Justin Morrill Act. So today we have overall 80 land grant universities and every state has at least one land grant university. So how land grant university system works in the United States? So this is very unique system. It has a three component called teaching, research and extension. Teaching in the campus, the credit, the course, the formal training for undergraduate degree, master's degree or doctoral degree. So that is a student enroll at the university and then they get, they complete certain credit hours, certain requirements, and they get their degree. And research is conducted in the research centers that is usually located in the rural areas and primary focus of the research is agriculture. And then there is an extension. Extension is located in every county that is the smallest political unit of the state. And it is like district in India or Nepal, or Africa, or Paris in France. So uh, the university is extended to the people at the grassroots level at the county. That is why it is called University Extension System. I'll talk about that a little more. 
But what is the core concept of the land grant university system in the United States? Basically, to conduct the research. Primary focus is conducting the research and then applying those research-based knowledge in practice with extension to the people, to the farmers and other individuals in the communities. Then after they will apply, they will try to understand what works, what doesn't work. That will come back to the research. Again, the problem, the issue they faced while applying, the problem, the issue they faced while applying research. So based on extensions, issues, and research conducted, those two knowledge are combined together to teach the student so that when a student will be ready to go to the world of work, you'll have a very good knowledge of what are the issues of the community and what are the solutions needed. Now, the extension system in United States is called the cooperative extension system. So after the establishment of the land grant university system in 1862, in 1914, the two senators, one representative and one senator from Georgia and South Carolina, they filed their motion in front of the Congress in the central government, telling that farmers has to go to the university. It is not often very easy for them. We need to have a cooperative extension system in every county where university faculty are working in that county with the offices and they will serve the farmers where they live. So basically it started with helping the farmers. So at that time, the federal government hired Simon Knapp, who is known as the father of extension. He was already working in the Southern states of the USA. And he showed what is the value of on-farm demonstration to the farmers. How, I can, how can we make a lot of changes in the farming practices and make better living for the farmers. So now the question is, what is extension service overall? So teaching in the campus is a formal training courses. However, extension is non-formal education. You, it, there is no need for, you have to have any education, any credit. You can join the program based on your interest. A youth of eight years old up to any years you are, 70, 80, 95, we get the people at as high as 85 years old, they come and participate in our program. This is non-credit course. They can just learn, use that in their day-to-day -day life. Mostly focus on rural communities. And since 1990, there has been some focus in the urban communities. The urban communities programs are includes horticulture and some youth development. It provides research-based education and helps people directly where they live to create positive changes in their life, in their farms. The cooperative extension system is called a cooperative system because the three levels of the government is involved in that. Local government, state government, and central government called federal government. And they, Three of those governments provide funding to the extension system. The county that is equal to the district in India, Nepal, Africa, they provide the building for the extension office. They, pro they provide program money, the money for transportation to go to the field and help people. They provide copy machine, printing machine, fax, phone, all those things. And they also provide the support staff, usually two support staff funded by the county. And then university provides the extension educator with master's degree and their salary is 40% covered by the county, 60% by the university. So to cover those salaries, the money comes from state government. Since I'm working in Idaho, I would like to say state of Idaho, the state of Idaho, the state government is run by governor and member of parliament that is called Congress. And then the central government is represented by United States Department of Agriculture, also in short called USDA. So these three are providing fundings. And then the state 
government and the central government USD has certain formula, they provide that funding. Now, for all the extension system in the United States runs with its vision and mission. It does not deviate from its vision and mission. And usually the mission and visions are similar throughout the 50 states in America. So vision is where we want to be. That's the vision. Mission is what we do now to get to that vision. So the vision of University of Idaho Extension is building a thriving, prosperous, and healthy Idaho. That's where, we, that's what we want to achieve as a university. And our mission is serve people where they live with research-based education. So by helping people, engaging them with research-based research generated knowledge, we believe that we want to achieve building a, a thriving and prosperous Idaho. You can see the map of Idaho on your right hand side as a picture. In the extension offices in the county are called with the university name first and then followed by the county name. So you can see here in Wisconsin where I work, it is called University of Wisconsin Madison Green Lake County Extension. In Idaho, you can see University of Idaho Extension Cannon County. University of Idaho Pate County. In California, it is called University of California Cooperative Actions in Colusa County. So it starts with the name of the university, ends with the county. So every county serves the people, educate the people of that community, of that county in four major areas. And those four major areas are agricultural and natural resources. That includes crop, and soil science, livestock and dairy, and natural resource covers forest, water, and other natural resources. Family and consumer sciences includes how we can make our families better, healthy habit, eat smart, manage your money better, build your better relationship with your uh, sons and daughters, and then Third program is for youth development is basically focused on youth of eight to 18 years old for their better future. It is called how we can make youth a better citizen of the country so that they are the future of the United States. The community development is the program that basically focuses on small businesses like gift shop, restaurant, and some other community development program, empowering people, institutionalizing them forming a group to do something, uh, developing some kind of cooperative working system. So these are the four program areas. So here I would like to tell that extension is started to serve agriculture, but over the years, they are now serving four major areas. So I'm talking about one of the county here in Idaho called Twin Falls County Extension. They serve these four program areas and every county serve these four program areas around the United States. In 50 states of America, there are about more than 3,000 counties, and every county has university extension system. And some of the examples of the program that county serves in those four areas are strong goal, strong bones, and healthy hearts for women, it is smart and healthy, horticulture and ornamental plants, cover crops, soil nutrient management dairy and beef production, youth leadership, Korea summer day camps, and then a small business development. It is very common in the United States to use social media for the programming. You can see we use social media a lot. So in the social media now, people don't have to stop by to the county office. They can just go to the social media and you can, they can just type University of Idaho Extension in their Facebook and they can find all the programs. So there is one example of the program, 4-H Summer Day Camps in Ada County Extension. This is pretty urban county, and you can see all the programs there, what is going to happen, what day, what time of the day, and what are the programs, how youth are going to participate. So it's pretty common to use social media, basically Facebook. The conducting program is not alone enough in extension because 
it is required by the law, we have to conduct the evaluation. So I'm showing you for 2020, it is already passed and we are now 2021, but 2021, what are the outcomes and outputs of our program? So this is how we found. How we found this, let me talk about that. There is a reporting system we have. So every extension educators or every uh, extension agent in those four program area, once they conduct the program, they have to go and enter their data in the reporting system. And that reporting system in online, I designed and created that here in Idaho. So everybody, every state has the extension system has their reporting system. So go and enter that data. And what we do, I do is I compile those data and present in this form. So in 2020, University of Idaho extension, even during the COVID pandemic, the data is way higher in the normal situation. But in the COVID pandemic, there were 220,000 direct contact with the people. Out of them, 86,000 people were contacted face-to-face -face through the programming, kind of classroom teaching, field days, like that. Farm demonstration. And then 8,520 educational activities were conducted. That educational activities varies from one hour to six hours to three days to seven days, continuous in the series. And those educational activities were offered from 1,800 different educational program. Educational program is kind of umbrella. And under that educational program, we offer several educational activities that is repeated throughout the state and in the same county, it is repeated. And then we offered more than 14,000 hours of educational program delivery to the classroom or field days. These are the outputs. Now in the outcomes, what did we found that out of 220,000 participants, we, real, we found that 40% of the participants reported increase in their knowledge as a part of their program participation. 7% reported increase in skills and 33% reported change in their behavior. That means they adopted the practices, skills they learned in their farm, in their life. And we asked them, how much money you saved or increased the yield? So we compiled that. We have found that people reported more than $7 million in their cost saving from the farming or applying that skill in their life and they save the cost or increase the yield. If you talk about family living, they used better diet, they reduced going to the doctors, those kind of things we calculate. So what is the research extension linkage in the United States? That was some of the questions that I found in the list of the questions. So as I mentioned in the beginning, there are research and extension centers in the rural areas. In Idaho, there are 12 research and extension centers. Fairly same amount of research centers are in all the 50 states extension system. So in that, a research center, we have an extension a specialist. They have a doctorate degree in subject matter like agronomy, plant science, plant pathology, entomology, soil science, water efficiency management, ag engineering, those are the things. And usually they have a 60% research appointment and 40% extension appointment. Usually that is the ratio. And they work directly with the extension educators. What they do is they conduct the need assessment with the extension educators and extension educators invite them in their county and they teach the courses with the extension educators, such as beef production, how to manage soil, soil fertility, nutrient management, those classes. Four H youth development programs are very important in, in the United States. It is when it comes to the name of the youth development programs, everybody's ears is standing. They are paying attention. So every year, they have a certain protocol to follow and then they will show their animals, beef, beef steers, dairy cows, lamb or sheep, and swine, that is called the pig. They show those animals and there is a judge from outside the judge will judge their animals and give them award with the first, second, third, and fourth position. So 
they at the end of the fair there is a one program called livestock auction so people from all over the county from another county they come and the bid in that auction with that animals and they usually pay to encourage the youth more price than in the market so when a youth participate in 8 year old he can participate until 18 year old and then in that 12 years period usually they make money they use that money for their college tuition and they usually very encouraged to go to the university where they reside it means they go to their one state's university so this is very important program and now i told you that we required by the law we have to have the evaluation conducted so in 1993 federal government passed a act called government performance result act by that act it is required by all the institution who receive federal funding they have to have evaluation conducted document the program impact and especially focused on extension the agricultural research extension and education reauthorization act of 1998 that mandates all the extension educators and extension system in the united states they must show the accountability of their program to stakeholders so federal government state government and the county government is asking us all the time we provide you the dollar we want quantification of that dollar in terms of how you help the people and what people people gain out of that program that we paid you for our dollars and that dollars come from the tax payers money so it is very important to become accountable that's all i have to present today and i would like to pass it to vikram kondenia to present his uh, evaluation thank you vikram back to you We can hear you, Vikram. You are muted. <clears throat> are you Are you able to hear me now? Yes, that's fine. You are good. Okay. Th thank you now for uh, the uh, brief introduction you gave to the extension system. It acts as a, a good segue for me to talk about uh, the role of evaluation specialists in the U.S. extension system that now just explained. so i will also pr present a brief uh, detail about my career path so uh, there, there will be an idea for any anyone coming uh, wanting to come from india to pursue uh, education here and also uh, they can see how i uh, landed in the evaluation specialist role i have a bachelor's degree in agriculture from acharya engineering agriculture university in andhra pradesh state of india and i did a masters degree there in the same university in agricultural extension education and after that uh, i uh, went to iowa state university uh, to get my phd degree in agricultural extension education and as now said that's where we met as students under the same major professor and we have been uh, collaborating since then after uh, graduating with a phd degree i did a couple of uh, post docs at iowa state university and also university of uh, connecticut uh, in these uh, two positions i was uh, helping the uh, extension uh, leadership and also the economic development leader leadership the extension director and the vice president for economic development uh, to help them come up with uh, their uh, monitoring and evaluation metrics and also write uh, the evaluation plans uh, for uh, the grant proposals after uh, working in those two uh, postdoc positions for about 3 years i accepted a position at uh, university of wisconsin madison as an evaluation specialist i had an ac academic uh, staff position there i i'll explain what uh, the different types of roles are uh, when we get to that part of the presentation uh, but i was there for 3 years basically serving as an evaluation uh, specialist carrying out the evaluation for several uh, projects Uh, including all the program areas that now covered in extension agriculture natural resources 
youth development, community uh, development, everything. So the point I want to make here is that an evaluation specialist uh, is not an expert in any particular production ag or any subject matter uh, as such that uh, the project relates to, but he or she is the expert in the social science design that is encompassed in program evaluation. I'll explain what, what all are included in program evaluation. And after three years of a stint at UW Madison, I accepted this faculty position four years ago. Uh, again, the working title is evaluation specialist. Uh, my position is uh, uh, right, like I just got to the associate professor rank this month. Uh, so I, I serve in the community and regional development program in the Department of Human Ecology. And my role is different here. I teach evaluation. I don't carry out evaluation as such. My students do it if uh, the partners have sufficient money to pay for uh, carrying out the evaluation. So that will become more clear when I give some examples. So this is overall my career path uh, so far. So who are these evaluation specialists in the extension system? So the, we are basically extension specialists, as now said. Extension specialists are, have expertise area in various topics like community economic development or economics or agronomy or livestock. And program evaluation is one of such expertise areas. So the production ag related, agriculture related uh, extension specialists are all like biology, life science experts, whereas a program evaluation expert, a specialist is a, a social scientist. So the evaluation specialist is mostly from a social science background. There are evaluation specialists uh, who have uh, like a master's and PhD degrees in statistics. So evaluation covers like many things. So evaluation specialists typically have faculty appointments in academic departments, such as uh, mine right now, I have a 40% research appointment, 40% teaching appointment, and then 20% for uh, university and also the uh, professional uh, academic discipline service, which includes serving on uh, such committees and also presenting at international meetings, uh, conferences, and uh, those kind of things. So the evaluation specialists are also hired as academic staff in extension and research departments, such as the one that I was working at University of Wisconsin uh, before I came here. And also they are a part of central governance units uh, where they're mostly taking care of the annual reporting now was presenting, uh, collecting the outputs, outcomes to report to the funder of the United States the Department of Agriculture. So they are part of the senior leadership team. So what do these evaluation specialists do? The evaluation specialists uh, work, we work with the county extension educators, they're called as agents in some states, they're called as educators in some states, and we call them advisors in California system because they have a research component also, and most of our county extension advisors have PhD degrees, uh, whereas the requirement is a master's degree, but our system has mostly a PhD uh, uh, degree holders. And what do I do when I work with these people? I provide the research base of how they should design their evaluations. So as I said, evaluation, when I talk about evaluation or when I mention the term evaluation to any student I meet at an international conference, they really don't uh, wrap their heads around what it means, what, what, what does evaluation cover? So overall, this is what evaluation covers, uh, a sound knowledge in program, extension program development and theories, program designs, what teaching learning processes uh, should be used, uh, needs assessment, data collection and analysis, report writing, presenting findings to various types of stakeholders. They can be like the, the people who are paying us to carry out the evaluation, or they can be political leaders who will fund the future programs, or they can be colleagues of students in the extension education field or program evaluation field. And we also publish in peer reviewed journals and also non-peer reviewed extension publications. So before going into specific examples of each role that an evaluation specialist serves, uh, it is important to see why should we evaluate the programs in the first place? So these are some of the reasons uh, that I came up with based on my experience. So the number one uh, reason is accountability. As now was telling, we get money from United States Department of Agriculture. So they want to know like how we are spending that money. Is it worthwhile to fund us with so much of money? 
So the extension educators have to evaluate their programs and uh, we have to submit annual reports to USDA to see uh, what uh, they are giving the money for is getting, is making an impact in the lives of the people that we serve through our education programs and our research-based extension. So the second reason why we should evaluate programs is program development. It helps in uh, program development. Like it's common uh, extension literature that uh, needs assessment is the first step in program planning. So needs assessment is a part of uh, evaluation. It, it falls in the umbrella of evaluation. So the next the other reason why we should evaluate our programs is to improve our programs. Like we are offering the programs and then it is important to know whether or not we are meeting the target so that any changes can be made as needed. So that's a, a very important uh, reason and we call it as formative evaluation. And then the next one, is to measure the outcomes. When we are offering the programs, every educator goes with the science base, and then there are some expected outcomes that have to happen. Like, or, or do they want to increase the knowledge of the people, or do they want people to adopt some behavior? That has to be measured. So those are called outcomes. Uh, for example, like when I, when I started this talk uh, today, I said that uh, one of the outcomes we are uh, uh, hoping will happen is that you all will gain a basic understanding of uh, what the extension system is and what, does, what do evaluators do in the system. So that outcome, how will we know if that happened? We have to ask you people like whether the lecture was good or not, right? So the same way we go back to the uh, clientele which who we are serving and then ask them like to, through different data collection methods, like it can be interviews, it can be surveys, it can be field observation, anything like there are a lot of uh, different methods. And then the other reason is impact assessment. So impact is a big picture thing, which can't happen in one or two years. So a program has to be running for multiple years, like five to 10 years in order to get to impact. When we talk about impact, uh, what we mean is uh, the big picture societal or environmental type of changes that are happening for the general public as a whole, not necessarily only uh, to the clientele that we are serving. And then the all the more important reason, another reason is self-learning, right? It's always good to know what we are doing, if it's working or not. And also the self-learning keep us motivated to do better. And then the final reason uh, that I think uh, is very important is the contribution to research. So if we evaluate programs, we have good amount of data uh, to conduct research and publish, and that will strengthen the education programs in the future. So these are some of the competencies that will be needed if someone wants to get uh, into the role of an evaluation specialist in the extension system here in the United States and also anywhere in the world, if you want to pursue a career in evaluation. So we should have a, a good a competency level in program theories, like program development theories. We have so many in extension. And then all the latest evaluation models, uh, we need to be well versed with uh, those. Then strong social science research background, uh, including methodology, survey development, data analysis and interpretation. Again, the data analysis can be quantitative data or it can be qualitative data. So some, some evaluation specialists are focused only on qualitative data. Some evaluation specialists are focused on only quantitative data and some use both the methods. So I am a mixed methods uh, uh, researcher. I do, I conduct both qualitative methods and quantitative methods, and I also teach uh, both quantitative data analysis and qualitative data analysis. And if a person is predominantly quantitative evaluator, then a strong background in statistics will be really helpful. Then project management skills are uh, really important, especially if you want to be an evaluation practitioner and not a faculty member, if you want to carry out evaluations, project management is uh, really important. Then data visualization skills are necessary because uh, we are, some of our stakeholders are really busy people, big politicians. They don't have time to read uh, big reports. So one pagers info, infographics, really cool visuals that catches their attention uh, will be really important uh, skill. And I don't have that skill set to the extent uh, uh, that makes it like a really good quality visual. So I rely on my students uh, who are like really super smart. So they help me with the data visualization. And then interpersonal effectiveness, uh, like easily approachable, uh, willing to accept your mistakes, that kind of interpersonal effectiveness. And then political maneuvering is uh, important, especially if you are working with uh, politicians to attract funding. 
And then communication skills, both verbal and non-verbal, are important uh, in any field, not necessarily uh, in, in evaluation. So I'll, I'll present examples from my work on the, on the different roles evaluation specialists can serve in the extension system. The number one role is annual reporting. Now already uh, spoke uh, uh, something about it. And then related to annual reporting is writing uh, program impact statements uh, catered towards different stakeholders. And then evaluation capacity building slash extension teaching. Then conducting research, evaluators can be researchers, uh, predominantly researchers also. And then practitioners, uh, evaluation practitioners are the people who are carrying out evaluations. They're not necessarily teaching evaluation. So I'll provide examples for each of these roles. So there is some context to what I'm talking. So roles one and two is annual reporting and impact statements, writing impact statements, which are closely related. So as I said, uh, we collect outputs. Outputs mean the products, what, what are uh, being developed how many people are being reached, how many products are coming out, like brochures or, or pamphlets or anything like that. And then uh, what outcomes we are achieving, like uh, has there been a change in knowledge or has there been a change in skill sets or people adopting what we are teaching? Those kind of things are outcomes. So all of them, all of the data has to be collected through a reporting system. As now said, he created one for University of Idaho because he's also the state leader for evaluation reporting there. But I don't do that part. My part is uh, a, a professor type of uh, job within the department where uh, I basically teach evaluation and conduct research on evaluation. And then I have uh, colleagues in the program planning and evaluation uh, office, the central government. They are a part of senior leadership. They take care of this. So now, so, so, now has like multiple hats. He also teaches evaluation, conducts research, and also he is the in charge for reporting. So he has a bigger uh, portfolio compared to me. So this is one example of an impact statement, how we write. So this is from one of uh, my colleagues. Uh, 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 the person is a nutrition family and a consumer sciences extension educator. As I said, we call them advisors here. So here we write it up as a paragraph, but I've broken down uh, that one into different segments. So you see what kind of data is needed. So the first one is the activity. So what are they doing, right? Conducting nutrition education classes, using eating smart, being active curriculum, and through other workshops. So then what did they do? They measured behavior change. So they collected through surveys that out of the 60, 650 people that attended the class, 600 people, like 93%, reported an improvement in one or more of the diet quality indicators. So they self-reported that. So we are not assuming, we are collecting data. And then what is the big picture that's happening? As a result of eating healthy, there is sufficient research which shows that if you eat healthy food, there is reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. And that is like an established fact. So then we can steadily claim that our program is contributing uh, to the overall public health. So we are never going to say that extension is the only uh, resource or only channel that is causing the change, but we just, take our part of the claim, that we are also contributing. So that has to be very clear. And what is the big picture that's happening in the state of California is our program is contributing to improve health for all the people. So again, we are not taking any major uh, uh, merit or claim. We are just saying that we are also contributing. So this is another example. I'm not going to read this. I just uh, give you like a few seconds to just go through this. So this is how we write impact statements. So this is another example from my horticulture extension agent. And she worked on a root stock trial. So you can read it. I'll just give you like 10, 15 seconds. Okay, I'll, I'll move to the next slide. So the third role, as I said, is evaluation teaching, the capacity building. Why do we call it as capacity building? Is my, because my students are my colleagues, the extension educators who are equally qualified in terms of uh, educational attainment. They have a master's degree or they have a, a PhD. So I 
offer training programs for them. So these are the topics that I cover here in California. And most of the states have very similar uh, topics that they teach. But there are some adaptations that need to be made based on the needs in each state. So I teach planning and designing evaluations. I teach needs assessments, how to conduct needs assessments. And then we teach uh, the third one. I do not lead it. My colleagues do it. So defining the, what our clientele are. And then I teach methods for measuring outcomes, survey design and development, sampling methods, data analysis, both quantitative and qualitative. I teach it up to the intermediate level. So I'm not like an advanced uh, statistist guy, but I can uh, teach up to intermediate level. And then uh, writing impact statements. So I showed you a couple of examples of impact statements. So continuing with the relation capacity building, we also do it through regional level collaboration. We, we, we have a team called as Western Regional Extension Evaluation Network. Idaho is also a part of that. California is also a part of that. So we are developing uh, training videos that all the states in the Western region can use based on whatever their need is. Then we are also, now and I are also a part of uh, national level research that is working to identify evaluation competencies that are needed by our county extension colleagues in order to evaluate the program. So it is a multi-state effort. And then uh, I offer guest lectures to our undergraduate and graduate students in uh, many different departments in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, and also in sociology department. I have offered in nutrition department and sociology department. I offer guest lectures on evaluation planning and uh, designs. So these are some of uh, the pictures of uh, my programs. So the first two pictures are uh, well, at two different locations when I was uh, teaching data analysis. And the picture below is, uh, I was teaching about outcomes, uh, outcome indicators, uh, inputs, outputs, that kind of a training. And then coming to the other role that evaluation and specialists serve is conducting research. I share what my research is. So my research is mainly focused on innovative evaluation methods and individual evaluation studies, like we carry out evaluation studies and then we publish from that. So if you can see the first paper here, which was published last year with uh, my co-authors from Wisconsin. So this happened in my previous job. So we came up with an innovative method uh, called group mapping to collect data from uh, little kids. So this uh, mapping exercise was both a fun activity for them to draw what they're learning and also like a data collection method for us. And the one on the right, again, this was for kids here in California. We developed a method called as PISA surveys. Uh, we collaborated with uh, researchers, like both these uh, people like Maggie and Waiting are my county colleagues. Uh, Waiting has since moved to Stanford University, but she was at the uh, University of California when we conducted this research. So if anyone is interested in reading all of these papers, they're available in my website, uh, web page, and also if you can reach out to me, I will send you, I'll share the full papers. And then these are from the evaluation studies. The one on the left is uh, we published our evaluation design uh, from a climate change project that was led by Purdue University. And on the right is uh, uh, a last year project, uh, like wildfires and other disasters are very common in California. So we conducted a needs assessment to know to what extent our extension, uh, county extension people are uh, prepared and what do they need to tackle wildfires and other types of disasters. So there also you can see that uh, I was the first author, uh, meaning that I, I led the study. It's not necessarily about an evaluation, but it's about a needs assessment. So an evaluator can be covering several different areas. That's what I'm trying to highlight. And another one where I published is related to statistics, methods, and individual projects. So this is a book chapter that I contributed to. Uh, it was predominantly quantitative data because uh, I was able to write it because I've taken statistics courses in the PhD program. And then the next two are from the individual evaluation studies. So these were at Wisconsin. Uh, these two uh, co-presenters uh, joined our team as well, our students. So they were our students and now they became our colleagues. They're both are evaluation specialists now. So these are from two different projects. So, and we are sharing this at uh, American Evaluation Association Conference. So that's an international conference. 
And then the final role is evaluation practice. As I said, we are hired as evaluation specialists to carry out evaluation. There we don't do any teaching and we are not required to do research, but we can if we want to. So these are some, uh, like some projects that, that I worked as an evaluation practitioner and all of these are at Wisconsin. Right now, I don't serve as a practitioner. If there is sufficient money to pay for my students, they carry out uh, for them. me and I hire students for each project. So the first one example is a climate change project led by Purdue. The second one was for a natural resource and conservation surveys where they developed a wetland identification tool and we evaluated the project. And then the other one was for Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And the last two are the healthy soils courses were developed and we evaluated those courses. And then phosphorus compliance workshops. I, I selected those two examples because we have a predominantly agriculture audience. So there are other many other projects that I've evaluated like environmental justice, uh, uh, racism, so many, so many other projects. And as, as I said, I don't need as an evaluation specialist to be the subject matter that the, top, that the project is uh, tackling. I need to be good at the social science and evaluation related expertise and whatever context is needed about the topic, the subject matter, I can sit with the PIs, the principal investigators and learn to the extent that I need. So they are not hiring me for my specific subject matter expertise in climate, climate change or wetlands. They are hiring me for my evaluation expertise. So this is what uh, we wanted to cover today. So this is the contact information of, of both of us. We have given our uh, uh, email IDs and also web pages and my phone number there is my WhatsApp number also. So if someone wants to uh, talk, uh, we can set up an appointment and talk. Uh, and we'll be happy to follow up with any of these uh, questions. So thank you and I'll hand it over to Rupak to uh, run the question answer session. And many thanks, Nav and Vikram. It was fascinating listening to you. Um, you know, we have quite a few interesting questions uh, that we received during the registration process itself. And we have received uh, some questions during the session. Uh, so I will start asking the questions. So the modalities, maybe, you know, whoever is comfortable uh, answering the question, you may pick it up of your own. So since this was a student's workshop, uh, student's uh, webinar primarily, so I will start with the question that we have received from many students and the graduate students, even the students who have completed their PhDs. Uh, and that is, what are the opportunities of extension specialists uh, in the USA in three different contexts? First, as a PhD scholar, second, as a postdoctoral fellow, and third, job opportunities and the job application process. And we have received these questions from uh, Indian and uh, Pakistani students and scholars. Thank you, Rupak, I'll take that question. Uh, I was supposed to mention a little bit about that during my presentation, but let's uh, take that question right now. In the county level extension educator job that is called agriculture agent, family living agent or educator in California, that is called advisor. Family living advisor, farm advisor, that's the name. But basically that the extension officer, agriculture extension officer, similar role in here in the United States, like in India or in Nepal. So they have a master's degree in the subject matter and they serve in the county. And then a specialist has the doctoral degree with some appointment in extension and research. And there are also faculties in the university, they have a doctoral degree in given subject matter like agronomy, livestock, plant science, soils. I have had the opportunities to be serving more about 17 different search committee in the last 11 years in Wisconsin and here. And I probably saw more than 10 committees here in Idaho. And at that time, we interviewed few people from Africa and uh, some other parts of the world. Yeah, two are from Africa, I remember now. And one was for the soil science expert, expert in soil, soil uh, research, sorry, uh, extension specialist in soil science. And one was horticulture extension educator for the county. 
So if you believe that you have enough quality, you believe in your quality and you believe in your subject matter, you believe that you can help the problem of the communities in that particular area, you are most welcome to apply. And there is in the United States, the system is in all the university, all the jobs, either corporate or government or university, there are usually five committee members and one is chosen as the committee chair. And chair's role is not different. He just ha he has he or she has only one vote, but he or connect with the candidate, organizes the meeting with the committee members. So, the how they can apply the application process. Number one, you go to the University of Idaho Extension Jobs, or University of California Extension Jobs, University of California Jobs, Academic Jobs, Professor, just like University of California Jobs. University of Missouri jobs, uh, Texas Agricultural and Mechanical University jobs. So that is a global competition. You can apply from anywhere. As I said, we interviewed people from Africa. Uh, Bikram also interviewed people, I think, from uh, Egypt, uh, uh, Iran, and we get all those kind of uh, people from there, and they get the job here. If you have a quality, there is always room for quality in the United States. So apply for those jobs with properly filled question, questions. And the jobs are given with the job description. What are the job description? What are the required quality? What is your experience needed in the similar area? Most of the time they are fresh. Some of the time they give some preference to the experience, but doesn't mean that only the people with the experience will be called for interview because interview is the main thing where you can show your caliber. So that's the best way for the jobs. And after you have a PhD, Many people apply from India, Nepal, China, Pakistan, Africa, Europe, Australia, England for the postdoc job, Italy. I had several friends when I was going to Iowa State University. Uh, they were from other parts of the country and they saw as a postdoc with their degree in that country. So there is opportunity. First thing that you should not hesitate to apply for, you apply and look for uh, some standard resume, standard application procedure, you have to write your cover letter and then you have to present your resume. Cover letter is the main thing. Resume is the main thing. So you have to write in appropriate format, not in the loose format. Look at some of the examples. If you just go and find out Dr. Bikram Kondenia CV, you can see our CV. So look at our CV is standard over the last 16, 17 years we have been, you know, every time we are improvising our CV. So first thing is don't hesitate, apply for the jobs and ensure that you have the quality for the jobs and you, that matches your quality. And you will definitely get the interview. And if you'll be selected in the interview, you'll get the job. And sometimes what they do is most of the time they do the Zoom interview with us, with you for the postdoc or the position job, a professor job, extension educator job, extension especially job. Then if they like you, they will call you here for the interview. They'll give you enough time to come and they'll give you the letter. So that way you can get the visa to come for the interview. Rupak, I'll, I'll just uh, chime in a little bit about uh, postdocs and uh, PhD scholar opportunities. So PhD uh, positions are usually fully funded. So if you meet all the requirements of graduate school, uh, you will get full funding, which means that your uh, fees uh, tuition is covered and also you'll get a monthly stipend. So if you're coming for a PhD, then uh, the funding is not an issue. But for masters, uh, it's kind of 50-50, some, some programs offer funding to start with, or for some you have to come here and uh, show your worth, uh, get good grades, and then uh, we'll uh, provide funding uh, from individual research grants, or also teaching assistantships. And re regarding post-doc, uh, there are opportunities, but they, in extension education and evaluation, that kind of thing, but they are not as many as uh, something in plant breeding or genetics, and other production agriculture related disciplines, but there are some opportunities. So that, that's just what this I wanted to cover. Okay, we have received one question uh, from a graduate student and uh, he's saying that uh, it seems that there is relatively less uh, opportunities and funding uh, for the agricultural extension or extension education departments. Uh, I mean, is it a myth or uh, this is really the path? 
Now, do you want me to tell? Yeah, I'll put you first. Yes, that's true. Uh, most uh, for the PSD, right? Uh, yes, both for the job or for the PhD. It's PhD and postdoc positions. Okay. Yes, uh, I don't believe that is a funding issue for agriculture extension department. Our professors in Iowa State always used to say that if we have a good student, the funding is always there. In PhD, I do not believe there is any funding issue because one of the things is very important for the student in that part of the world to understand that. Most of the universities are R1 university. And to have that R1 university, they have enough research and graduating from that university to maintain that R1. And R1 brings more funding from the central government. So PhD is never an issue. I know some university, I don't think that is the issue, even Iowa State University or our university doesn't have any problem for a PhD for because they want those kind of things. Or postdoc, yes, that's true for the postdoc, there are comparatively less position in ag related to agricultural elections and rural development, but that is not often true. For example, uh, there are projects. In those projects, if you apply, postdoc is always comes with the project money. Most of the time that comes with the project money. And in those projects, people hire the agricultural extension uh, postdoc. Vikram also worked in the postdoc for, for, for quite a while and then uh, the funding is available. Yes, that's true. Compared to, agro compared to agronomy, livestock, plant pathology, entomology, it is less. But production is also less, right? Agricultural actions and production is less. Most of the people go to plant pathology, agronomy, soil science, uh, livestock, dairy, see, uh, so many areas. And agricultural actions and education, only one area. So it's obvious that if there are nine postdocs, there may be one or two postdocs for ag extension, but there are. There are. And if you have some background in evaluation, there is always room for you in the United States. If you have a strong statistics, if you understand evaluation, if you understand programming better, there is always room for. There are a lot of manpower needed in that area in the, in the United States. That is my personal experience. Thank you. Back to you, Rupak. Look, uh, I just want to add a little bit, Rupak. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, it's just my understanding, I'm not uh, telling that it is the fact. And my observation over the uh, last 15 years has been that if you come here as a student, the career path is much more easier, like even for postdoc. Because I was here, I was meeting people, uh, I already knew the postdoc mentors that hired me as a student. I used to meet with them. I took classes from them. So they know what I am, what my skills are and what I can do. Uh, so it's easy for them to invest in me compared to someone coming from outside uh, where it's a longer uh, process. And again, as now said, because we don't have a lot of postdocs in extension education. So it is easier for people who are already in the country, but that doesn't mean that uh, there's no opportunity at all. For example, like right now I have written three, uh, submitted three grant proposals where I have written a postdoc position in all those three grant proposals. And if, if they get funded, I'm just going to go for uh, the best postdoc that I can find from anywhere in the world. It can be Africa, it can be Pakistan, it can be India, it can be my own university, Andhra Pradesh, anywhere. Whoever I think uh, is the best, I will hire that person. Thank yeah. uh, you, it, it is a very small question. It's one of our students that he has asked that, what are the uh, softwares which are mostly used in our discipline so statistical data analysis and data visualization. I mean, it's... Yeah. So I can tell the ones that I and my students use, and I also tell some of the things that are generally used, now can also chime in. So I, for my quantitative data analysis, I mostly use SPSS. And for qualitative data analysis, I use a MAX, a QDA, uh, and NVivo. Uh, but uh, my students use R for quantitative. My students use uh, Stata. And uh, one of the students that actually recently graduated, uh, she was at a much higher level than me in statistics. So it's a mutual learning process. Uh, I learned uh, quite a bit from her. So like, everyone is not an expert in everything. So we don't need to be good at everything. So these are the five software that we use. And then data visualization, as I said, it's not my, uh, I wouldn't consider it uh, my strong uh, area. So my students use PowerPoint, my students use Adobe, like they are really good, like uh, all these young kids, they're really good at uh, those kind of things. So I just depend on them. 
Uh, Rupert, there are one question from Deep Banerjee. Can you read that, please? Yes. Uh, uh, actually, the last question was asked by Deep. Uh, yeah. uh, after that, there is Subhachit Banerjee as well. Subhachit yes. Banerjee. Subhachit, yeah. So, but Deep Banerjee has one question. And can you see it now, this question? Yeah, 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 I can see it. What is skills a good researcher, any kind of quantitative or qualitative mixed should have in your field of research? What is skills a good research should have in your field, uh, including both qualitative and quantitative? I'll ask Vikram to respond to that question. Uh, can you please repeat? I got distracted. Yes, uh, uh, Deep Banerjee asked, Banerjee, right? I think Deep Banerjee yeah. asked the question that what are the skills of a good researcher, both in qualitative and quantitative or mixed method? Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so a good researcher needs a really good, a solid understanding of uh, the topic that's being researched, like program development, field level understanding, and they need to be really good at data analysis, whether it is qualitative or quantitative. And uh, as I said, the best approach that I think is uh, mixed methods. So take uh, a lot of statistics courses, uh, a lot of qualitative research courses. Uh, so those are the main things. And then patience. <laughs> like uh, if you want to do a PhD, then we need to be really patient for five years, three to five years. And uh, like uh, keep trying to publish in good impact factor journals. Uh, so that is uh, one of the basic uh, skills that is needed like uh, being patient, like a lot of reading of literature and those kind of things. And uh, one question from Subhadis Banerjee that I can ask that uh, his uh, intention of the question is, the extension organization is needed to be very effective for program development and implementation. But these days, the how effective extension is both in developed and developing world, that's true and how the funding sources are. Yes, that's true. Extension has gone through a lot of changes in the United States, and there has been a lot of funding problem. But it does not mean that extension is going to be vanished. Extension will be always there to help the committee as long as the land grant university is there. And it is the taxpayer's money. Taxpayers always want extension in different forms. So yes, with the change in uh, various technology, change in needs of the people with the changing climate, with the changing environment, education. These days, the kids are born with the new technology. So with that, we have to focus more on how we can be more efficient with the changing environment of the society. So yes, for example, University of Idaho Extension is growing and growing and growing. We have never gone back or we never, has a, never had a budget cut. Uh, extension University of Wisconsin has some problem in uh, Iowa State University extension has some problem the budget cut but you know that goes in the different forms they change they restructure the extension system to meet the needs of the people so there will be always extension there will be always jobs we keep on changing according to the according to the changing society either restructuring extension either hiring people for example these days we have focused a lot in the last few years we have hired more than five people in youth development program with focus on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So with that focus, we have got a lot of money from the legislature, from the state government. So yes, we, we have some problem over the years. Yes, there has been a lot of budget cut in extension. Example, Pennsylvania, Ohio, they have a budget cut. Texas A&M, California has a budget cut, but extension is still there in different forms and a uh, few employees had the number of position has been reduced and some areas that it has been increased like sustainability, IPM, uh, 4-H STEM, 4-H youth development. So we change according to the situation. We are keep on changing and there is always talk among the leaders. I just had a three days talk with the leaders uh, in the retreat. We talked about how we are going to make our extension effective. And then there is one question from uh, I think this is a question from uh, for Dr. Goswami, Annapurna Kalandurg. I, I think I pronounced her, her or his name correctly. Uh, can you please, this said many thanks to both Dr. Vikram and Dr. Nab. And then uh, I'm non-agricultural person from India. Uh, may, may I know from Dr. Goswami, how is this system in India? How climatic change projects help in facing natural 
calamities on the crops to Dr. Vikram. So I think this is a question for yeah. Goswami and Dr. Vikram, yes. Okay, so I am taking the first question. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to explain it in maybe in a couple of minutes. So the, an impressionistic explanation is that we have two principal streams uh, of agricultural education and extension in India. Uh, one stream of the union ministry that provides agricultural education through Indian Council of Agricultural Research. So they have a large number of state agricultural universities and central agricultural universities. So apart from providing education, they also provide some extension services to the university's extension wing and through a very specialized kind of institution called uh, Krishi Vigyan Kendra. So this uh, extension provided through state agricultural universities and Krishi Vigyan Kendras, they are called first line extension. So this is not the predominant form of extension, that, but they provide very important extension services to our farming community. The pre predominant form of extension provided by the union ministry is delivered through uh, the Department of Agriculture, Cooperation and Farmers Welfare. And uh, that is actually delivered in collaboration with the state government or the Department of Agriculture of individual states. And in India, in agriculture is a sub state subject in the, in the federal structure. We, uh, agriculture is a state subject. So state delivers the um, programs developed at the union ministry to their cultural department. There is no uniform structure of extension uh, system uh, in all the states. There are a little variation from state to state, but generally it comes from the state level to the village level. So from director level to the grassroots level extension functionary, they have hierarchical system. And uh, at least one, for example, in our state of West Bengal, we have at least one agricultural extension officer at the block level. I mean, for example, uh, a block usually covers uh, 1.5 lakh to 2 lakh population. Uh, apart from this, there is one very interesting, uh, you know, structure of self-governing bodies in India. We have Panchayati Raj system. So although this Panchayati Raj system is not directly providing extension services, but they are collaborating with the state machineries to develop the programs, and especially in identifying the intended beneficiaries of the extension programs. Recently, there has been a restructuring in the agricultural extension uh, institutions in India called Agricultural Technology Management Agency. So it is a, a reorganized system that has taken a concrete shape in the last decade. This is basically an autonomous district level agency who are responsible for decentralized planning and delivery of extension services at the district level through their uh, subsidiary alliances, which is present at the block level. So in a summary, so I, I think uh, in a two or three minutes, I could have said this. Uh, Dr. Kondina, you have one question from uh, yeah. So Hazwan, the next Hakeem. question for me. No, no there, there is another question. Uh, how climate uh, climatic change projects help in facing natural calamities? It's from the same person, Anapurna Kalyanjal. Before I answer this question, I have to tell that uh, she's my aunt who is attending to support me. So she is a physics uh, professor uh, stationed at CGCRI, Kolkata. So coming to the question, uh, so we develop different types of uh, decision support tools to help the farmers uh, uh, use those tools or when to plant something or uh, like what kind of climatic conditions are suitable. So they can use those online uh, decision support tools to make any decisions related to uh, the production questions. And also the other study that I presented uh, conducting a needs assessment gives us the, an understanding uh, to what extent our people are already ready to uh, offer, offer education about uh, climate change, right? Like wildlife or like wildfires or any other disasters. So evaluation contributes significantly uh, in addressing any climate change related education program that happens in the country. Vikram, there's one question for you that uh, they say, uh, our, eva um, our evaluation specialists are also involved in program improvement. If yes, how, what percent of evaluation findings are used in evaluation improvement? 
Yeah, so that is a very good question. Uh, so the, the intention, like what we teach, uh, like repeatedly, is uh, to use the evaluation findings for uh, improving the programs. That doesn't happen to the extent uh, that we desire. Mostly, people are collecting evaluation data at the end of the project to uh, for accountability purposes. But my main focus and also my colleagues' uh, focus has been to uh, use, uh, make sure that we use the evaluation findings uh, that they get used. So that's why we need the data, data visualization skills to come up with uh, like very brief uh, one pagers that catch attention. So that is a work in progress. I, I wouldn't say that it is at a satisfactory level uh, in, even in the United States. But if you take it worldwide, uh, that, that is something that we as extension education professionals need to work on to make our research uh, inform the decision making. I don't see any other question in the chat. If uh, people have any questions, they can put in the chat or they can speak uh, verbally uh, <clears throat> on muting their... So I have received one question from uh, Vina from uh, Anand Agricultural University. Uh, I'm rephrasing his, his, his question. What is concerned is that we have had a lot of uh, rural development and extension programs in India, uh, but the impact has not been uh, very conspicuous. When I add my part to this question is that, is it due to inappropriate valuation or impact assessment or uh, the program formulation was at the fault? Uh, and if I'm clear, maybe both of you can take the question. Now, do you want me to go? Or do you want to go? Yeah, 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 make it on, please. So, yeah, so as I said, I agree with uh, you. Uh, I think the evaluation results uh, need to be used more. And also, like when I was in India some 15, 16 years back, the people who are conducting the evaluations in all the big projects, actually they did not have, like not everyone, but most of the people, they did not have a background in evaluation. They were predominantly social science, economy, economics researchers, strong in statistic skills, but that doesn't uh, really help with evaluation. The person should have, they, they really develop like really good surveys, a very strong statistical analysis, Everything happens, but evaluation has to happen in a context and the recommendations have been made based on the context. And my observation has been that at least 15 years ago and even very recently, uh, people who are conducting the evaluations are not, uh, really they do not have a background in evaluation. Uh, uh, one I of the things that uh, I would like to add here, uh, Rupak, that uh, Extension educators are hired, Vikram already presented in his session that with the subject matter background and evaluation is not their background. They don't know the value of evaluation, but the, uh, over and over again, the federal government has emphasizing the outcome assessment from the program because of the taxpayers money that all the governments provide at local, state and county level. So yes, uh, evaluation specialists, specialists are hired more more and more with the evaluation background and those university extension, they didn't have evaluation, they are hiring more evaluation. So the value is coming up uh, to make understand what is the value. But if we can give the data the way I gave, people are understanding, oh, this can be done out of the programming with the evaluation. We can do the reporting like this to give accountability answer. So it is coming more and more. People are realizing more evaluations are evaluation specialists hired. But over the days to come, people will value it. Also in today, it is required for every USDA projects you have, you have to have an evaluator. Back to you, Rupak. Oh, okay, I previously received one question from one of my co uh, colleagues from ICAR. Uh, and he himself is a very good researcher. So he asked that, oh, what are the different research focus uh, in US extension and uh, uh, second is that, uh, is there a definite and clear trend uh, in this research focus? I mean, is there a clear change in the focus of research which is undertaken and addressed by the extension specialist in the unit, United States of America? Yeah. Now, first I'll ask Peter to answer that, then I'll, I'll chime in. So uh, th there is a clear focus, but uh, when uh, faculty are hired, extension specialists uh, in any of the uh, subject matters, like agronomy or uh, plant science or animal science or evaluation, anything, 
so they have the freedom uh, given in the power of a big picture umbrella to design their own uh, uh, define and design their own research program but uh, the consistent trend within evaluation or extension education has been a clear focus on uh, experiential learning uh, extension educational processes uh, evaluation methods that is consistent uh, throughout uh, all the states and also uh, we are trying to understand it in the context of the existing uh, clientele like some states um, predominantly have hispanics some states predominantly have uh, black people uh, some states predominantly have asian immigrants so in the context of uh, those uh, conditions we are trying to control these variables using the regression models and trying to come up with uh, uh, like our own findings of what works best in a particular context and again coming to the production agriculture related uh, extension education research a robust needs assessment is undertaken at the beginning when the, the person joins the job he or she is expected to uh, indicate how they arrived at the needs we have to conduct a needs assessment and report it in our, our first year performance evaluation why am i focusing on those topics it's it's not just like uh, i i know this and i'm teaching this i have to show why i'm like when i presented the list of uh, teaching right and also my research i have to show them why i have done why i'm doing that how am i serving the people in california and that is, that can be different from what now does in idaho like his research topics given the overall umbrella of extension education can be different also one of the things that i would like to say it here it is very well research focused because in the united states in the land grant system especially for the college of agriculture the role of commodity association is very important that is often we called industry the industry is very important because throughout the 50 states we have a big commodity association so i'm part of some of the commodity association i attend their meetings for example a uh, corn growers association dairy uh, dairy association beef producers association dairy producers association a uh, potato uh, commission i think that is called potato commission yes that is a potato growers association so every single bushel bushel is a 52 pound every single bushel every single bushel 52 pound of potato corn or uh, 100 weight in case of vegetables they have sold certain amount certain percentage of the money goes to their association so that their association can fight and lobby their case with the legislature so those association have a lot of those association have a lot of and then when we were hiring a soil scientist here we had a association member in the committee so they were looking for what really the focus they have so they they always coordinate and work with college of agriculture to conduct the research in the area that they, their producers need because it is represented by the producers and there is always a good educational pressure for the research with the college and they provide the money that money is used for post doc to conduct the research and then uh, also every research centers have their own focus some of them have a general focus some of them have a special focus and so it is very connected with the association commodity association commodity groups so we have to focus on commodity groups views and they have a very big role and their say is highly valued by the college of agriculture they have a direct contact with the college of agriculture dean even with the president thank you back to you rupak uh, so we received another question from uh, shubhajit i mean he still a student uh, so what he wants to know is that uh, extension intends to bring in behavioral change at the individual level Uh, but many of the decisions for sustainable natural resource management that may require uh, group level behavior change so collective uh, behavior behavioral change so uh, what are the extension tools at its disposal especially in the context of uh, us extension that can be used to mobilize group for sustainable uh, management of natural resources okay i give one best example here we have a forestry where we need a uh, lot of for we have a individual forest in idaho in the northern idaho and that is called panhandle forestry that is uh, individual people have the forestry acres of 100 acres of forestry so we include that then we have a water users group association then we involve those groups 
Water Users Association, we have a continuous meeting with them. We design and teach program for them. So that groups decides, makes the decision about what they want to do about the water efficiency in this particular area and how they want to organize that uh, related to the issues of the water. So associations are involved, groups are involved. That is a self-formed volunteer groups. Uh, the forestry is a self-formed group. Water Users Association is kind of formal groups because they have been there for a while. So those groups are always pressurizing the university. So we work with them closely and they implement the decisions. That's how it works. At the individual level in the, in the healthy living or uh, saving money, we work with the individual people in the community. For the farmers, we work with the individual farmers in the community. They come and uh, participate in our teaching in the group. For example, 50, 60, 20 farmers, they come. We have a beef school, we have a cereal school, we have a potato school, we have a into IR, IRLS, Idaho Rangeland Symposium. So in that, people come to our meeting. We organize that meeting. We put in the Facebook, we send the letters to the individual farmers. We have that list developed over the years. 700, 800 farmers, we have a list. In the county, we have a couple of hundred list of the farmers. They come to the meeting and then they, got, they get our brochure and they come and then they ask individual questions and they also invite us individually. Our research specialists go individually. They come and visit the farms. We have a, a field day. Field day every year we organize. That is organized in the research center. So in a field day, usually 400 people participate, 700,000 people participate. And then they look at what is going in the research. Our specialists present and people come in the tractor. There is a trailer. In that trailer, seats are assigned and tracks are moved slowly. And then we sit in the tractor, they present and they see. Also extension educator go and attend those. When I was extension educator, I was attending field day. So that's how we learn. And we have that thing we learn. And we also conduct on farm research. We are, that is called farm cooperators. So we work with, we find farm cooperators. We are, I'm recently involved in the evaluation of a soil science program, soil fertility program, a nutrient management program with one of the extension specialists. And she told me that she had uh, uh, 36 people interested in her program and she conducted in the 36 farms for research. So farmers are directly seeing that research. And we are, once we conduct research individually, they give us their farm, they plow their farm with their tractor, and then we plant seeds and everything for the research. They provide irrigation and then research specialists and ex uh, extension educators, extension specialists go there frequently. And then we organize field day a couple of times a year. That's what all those 36 farmers and other interested farmers come and see what is happening in the field right away uh, in, the, in the crops. And we also present them the re, uh, soil science lab result of the soils. So that's how they see it. It's pretty visible, pretty organized, pretty connected, pretty engaged. That's what we work for. That's what we are here for the farmers, community, individual businesses. and. Uh, there is always pressure from them to do best for the uh, communities. And then uh, county commissioners, that is called county commissioner, district level politicians, like in India, they continuously visit. We have to meet with them every month as an extension office and present our progress. We have to present our progress continuously. And then we have an extension advisory committee, sorry, extension advisory board. We meet every year. So in that board, they also ask a question. We have to tell them what is happening actions and what we are doing. And we ask them for what are the challenges they see in their, in their communities and we collect those. So there is a continuous connection. And the legislator will ask us questions. We have to present, our dean has to present, our extension director has to present, our college of agriculture dean has to present in front of the joint uh, committee for agriculture and finance. There are two different committees. We have to present them what we have been doing, why we need the money. So it's a pretty accountable process. Check and balance there. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Uh, Goswami. I okay. just want to add one brief yeah. thing to that, Rupak. Uh, so we also develop, when we develop the impact statements, that's why we are focusing on the big picture. Uh, so we are also thinking, what does this uh, have for public? What is the public value? not just uh, the people that extension is serving, that's a private value to the individual, but we also write the public value statements. For example, as I said, if people eat healthy, 
uh, and reduce the risk of the disease. So it's contributing to the overall health costs of California. So that, that part is also like kept in mind when we are uh, doing the evaluations. Uh, and now, uh, uh, Kalyan has asked you one question. Uh, you can yeah. try to take it up. Oh, I don't see, I see Subhajit, Subhajit Bonerji. I'll ask his, uh, answer the, his question, but before then, what is the question of Kalyan? I couldn't see it here. Let oh, me see. He's writing that, uh, why is that percentage of people with the knowledge change and behavior change close? but people who acquire skills are so less despite so many of activities undertaken. Thank you. That's a very good question. I also realized that as an evaluator that why that skill is less. So what might have happened that because of the pandemic, we couldn't be able to conduct more and more evaluation that as required. We only uh, conducted a survey with 26,000 of the people and out of that 21,000 of the people are responded. We have a less program than the last year because of the pandemic, because we couldn't meet face to face. But that is the focus we are going to put more with the program teams. We have a program teams, about seven program teams. I have a meeting with them throughout the year. So I'm going to bring that question that we need to have a more and more evaluation and focus more on skill development. There could be also that uh, we organize the program. Our program is basically more focused on lectures or uh, not more on experiential hands and hands learning. So we have to focus on that more. However, having said that most of our field days are hands-on and focus on skill development, but I believe maybe questions were not there asked much. And also sometimes people do not answer all the question and we cannot enforce them to answer that question. But that's a good catch. I also realized when I was presenting to my team and that's a good catch. Uh, but having that less skill development, people still have, there is a one thing also to realize that more people have changed the behaviors. So without learning the skill, they cannot change the behavior only with the knowledge. The knowledge, the difference in knowledge, skill and behavior, just for students, I would like to tell you that you don't need to go to the college to gain the knowledge. I can understand how rockets are built and send it to the space, but I cannot build a rocket and send it to the space because I don't have a skill. So for the skill, you go to the college to learn that skill. And then your understanding is breezed by the skill. Knowledge and understanding breezed by the skill. Understanding means the ability of a person to employ the learned practices. That's ability. That's how with the understanding they can change their behavior. They can adopt their practices. So there is also one glitches. If the skill has not been changed, how they could be able to change behavior about, about higher person of the people. So there must be some glitches that uh, we did not ask appropriate question about his skill but the skill was there and people changed their behavior. But uh, I'm going to pay more attention to, to that, that how we are going to rectify and uh, change that problem. And one question from Shubhajit Banerji, it's a very good question. I deeply appreciate about discrimination policies. The federal government requires equal access to the educational services and education to the people in the every society, every communities, by every university, especially land-grant university has more responsibility on their shoulder. So we have a diversity and race and ethnicity, uh, I would say examination, I would say critical examination by the federal government. Federal government comes every five years and looks at our program. They've literally come here for a week in our university in all those university, every five years they have a turn, then we, they provide us their value. We have to present in front of them what is happening, what are the programs we did, what are the diversity, race and ethnicity, how they have been involved. And they give you some uh, critical examination of the, and a critical advice of what is not happening. So we always focus on that diversity, race and ethnicity is a high priority at the University of Idaho, University of Idaho Extension, and with every university. So we are doing, and it is, we are doing, doing better every day. This is the process. It comes with the time. It cannot be done over the night. So we are working on that. And Subhajit, that's a very good question. Yes, everybody has equal access. We have to approach. As soon as we come to know there is an ethnic group or race, ethnicity, tribe in a county, it is our job to approach them and let them know what are the educational services we offer? 
it is their choice to participate or not to participate. But once we come to know there are different race and ethnicity in particular part of the county, if we don't know about that, as an educator, we have to go and visit their community, find their local leaders and tell them what programs we have. So we are serving Hispanics a lot. It's a growing population in the United States. We are serving a lot of Hispanic. We are serving African-Americans. And we are serving all kinds of uh, groups. We are serving refugees. Uh, University, uh, sorry, uh, Boise is a very refugee-friendly uh, city. And we are helping a lot of refugees for a small farming because they grow their product in the small farm behind their backyard and they sell in the farmer's market. Farmer's market is uh, here implemented, conducted. They are there uh, like hat bazaar in India, like market in India, in rural town. So in the, in the rural towns and also in the small town and big town like Boise, capital city of uh, Idaho, people come with their farm products and they put their stall for a couple of hours. They come usually early in the morning by seven. They are there until noon and we go and buy from them. So we help those people who are uh, putting their stall in the farmer's market and they are mostly refugees, mostly African-Americans and Hispanics. Back to you, Dr. Goshon. Uh, we have one uh, uh, interesting question from Deep that how US extension systems are promoting women's participation, how gender issue is addressed explicitly. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Like race and ethnicity, in the diversity, we have a race, ethnicity, and gender. Not only that, we have to report gender. So in our reporting for the direct contact, we report race, white, black, uh, Pacific Islander, male, female, youth, how many people we serve. If we do not serve, as mandated by the federal government, federal government will give us instruction or they will not fund our program. So we are very serious about that. We are focused, not only serving, but hiring our colleagues from the race, ethnicity, diversity, and from the uh, gender. So we are doing that. We are very concerned. That is always a talk day to day. President talks about it, Dean talks about it, every university, every university. Wisconsin, California, that is a major focus. But because of some cultural differences, sometimes people don't want to come forward and ask for uh, the uh, required resources. But we have resources, we always inform them. And we always connect with the local people. We, we translate our resources in English to Hispanic, Spanish language. And we have hired a Spanish language translator, certified translator. And when you work with the Hispanic community, we find their local leaders. I work with Amish. It was required and it was very uh, liked program. I was also awarded because of my work with the Amish. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Goshan. Okay. Uh, I received one question from uh, Pakistan by Ramiz Akram Khan. And what, how do you compare the quality of extension services uh, between uh, what is provided in developing nations uh, in comparison to developed nations. And you'll be very, very interested to answer these because you have worked with extension specialists from both uh, these worlds. Yes, thank you. I work in uh, Nepal, Bikram has worked in India and extension I worked for about 14 years. Then I came here. I've been working here for about more than 11 years with the extension. Then my three years degree with the doctorate degree was um, also I did the internship and we, we did research in extension here. A couple of differences. It is very difficult to compare the extension system because every, every extension system has its one strength and its one challenges. And every government has its own focus. But I can say two things that in India and Nepal, usually 7% of the population of the country are served by extension. However, in United States, 30% of the population is served by extension. And we always say one word here that uh, extension is the best kept secret, like in India and Nepal also. Many people don't know if there is extension and the extension is their one county. So those people who know about extension, they come and get the service. We approach them also. We send out brochure, we publicize in the Facebook. Uh, for, for me that uh, Nepali or Indian extension system or Pakistan extension system are equally good with the resources provided with the way they serve to the people. And uh, here in uh, 
United States, evaluation is required about to show quantification of the dollar figure mandated by the federal government. So that way, maybe you know our evaluation is probably more, uh, what is that called, effective. We are more focused on evaluation to understand what are the outcomes. And maybe evaluation is not uh, at par or uh, very required in the developing world. We, when I was working mostly by the number of people contacted and the budget spent is a major focus of evaluation. But here, evaluation is what is the change in knowledge, skill, and behavior adoption of the practices and return on investment. So that may be some of the differences. Otherwise, number of people served are less in Nepal and India, more in uh, United States. But one of the things that we have a challenge, it is from the research, I'm not telling that. The small farmers are not mostly served by extension in, in, in both developed and developing world, because most of the time extension goes with the progressive farmer and with the farmers with high uh, amount of acreage. So that should be one more focus about how we are going to serve small farms. With given that we have a, in IDO is very effective in small farms. We have a, a small farms program teams. We have a hired educator to serve the small farms to the people who are in the farmers market. They produce in half an acre, one acre, two acre, especially vegetable production, fresh market vegetable production that can be sold immediately in the farmers market. So we have been gaining access on that more and more. But if you talk to me about Wisconsin or Iowa, yes, there are some challenges. Then Vikram can he speak his views about his experience in India and California or Wisconsin. Thank you. Back to you, Vikram. So, so I just want to add a couple of things. Uh, as now said, uh, each extension system has to be understood in the context in which it operates. The main differences I have found uh, are the university is associated with extension here. Uh, whereas in India, it's uh, the responsibility of the department and the Ministry of Agriculture. So my understanding is that uh, that research linkage is better here. Uh, the extension people have better access to research, whereas uh, that may be lacking in, uh, I can at least talk about India because the, that's where I spent uh, a chunk of my life. Uh, so the, the linkage between the university scientists and uh, like someone like agriculture officers or uh, the ADS, that doesn't happen that much, I think, in India. And again, um, th this evaluation component is not uh, really huge uh, in India. So it is being, it was not uh, like significant even 20 years ago here, also in this country, but now they're requiring, the USDA is mandating that you need an evaluation specialist in each state and also on all the grant proposals. So that I think uh, is the difference. And the other uh, significant difference is that the type of clientele we serve, uh, the illiteracy, the literacy levels are different. Here also there are quite a few people who are, who are uh, still like not that good with technology, but I, I understand that it is more in India, at least I don't know about other Asian countries. Rupak, there is a one uh, paper we published in 2012, I believe, or a little later. It was, it was well received by the people in, we published that for the context of that uh, developing world, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. It is called government run versus university managed agricultural extension system. You can find it in the Google and you can download it, it's so free. Or if you ask send an email to Vikram, Vikram can send you the link and PDF file also. It is about 12 page paper, including a reference citation. A core paper is nine pages. And we have uh, done a very good job on that. We tried very hard uh, at that time to do it. So it gives you a clear picture and that is even relevant after six or seven years. Yes, I, I have read that and I enjoyed reading that. Uh, I have the last question because I have to uh, close it because it's already uh, you know 45 minutes. We have had uh, intense discussions. And the last question is from my side and maybe from uh, a couple of other registered participants. So when we were students, uh, you know, our teachers introduced us to a, to a very important paper written by Niels Rowling back in 1985. And uh, as I can remember, that was presented at the University of Guelph as a part of invited lecture uh, with their extension. When he was writing that, uh, that extension was increasingly becoming preoccupied with the knowledge system approaches. And then the concepts of ACIS and AIS, you know, came into the picture. So uh, it's my question because you work with some of the top extension specialists in the world. 
wither extension? Are we standing at a juncture or it's a business as usual that we will continue with wither extension? Yeah, I would uh, ask Vikram to uh, firstly speak about that. So uh, Rupak, I just got distracted, sorry, by the chat that came my way. Can, can you just uh, repeat in one, one brief sentence what the essence of your question? I mean, so, wither extension, if we ask uh, you two that, uh, is it going to be the same in the next decade or are we standing at a crucial juncture? Okay. So this has been discussed for the last 20, 30 years. So I think extension will exist. It's not going to go because we provide that uh, personal touch, uh, human touch, and also the main stake is that we are unbiased source of information because we don't have any personal stake. We provide uh, the research-based uh, knowledge that uh, is generated at the university. The format in which extension will be offered uh, will definitely change. Uh, there'll be less in, in person because even uh, as a result of this uh, pandemic, uh, people are still uh, uh, not going to be that comfortable coming back uh, to the same model. So the model, how it is delivered will change and what type of skills uh, will be needed to be a successful extension agent, especially at counties and also like a faculty member will change and extension will need to collaborate more and get into more uh, program areas. But I think uh, we are here, uh, we are going to stay. I don't think we'll become irrelevant. Even in the time of uh, all the information being available on internet, but still uh, we have the uh, cushion of uh, having that unbiased research base. And also uh, one of the things that I, I'd like to add that uh, this is the age of technology. For example, drones are used everywhere. So university has hired the expert in, in the drones in, to conduct the research and they are conducting drone uh, to conduct the, they are using the drones to conduct the research and for many, many other information. So more and more technology oriented agriculture is, uh, agricultural extension system is going and university changing to that area. So I, I just said that extension will be changing as per the required change of the, as per ongoing change of the communities. And one, I have seen one last question from Subhajit that Subhajit mentioned that how federal government programs or subsidy or loans are using by the farmers. Yes, uh, federal government has one program called Farm Bill. And Farm Bill is providing subsidy to the farmers for their uh, crops. And uh, we have hired a Farm Bill expert here in Idaho and in many states, extension system, they have a Farm Bill expert. I was also par part of that Farm Bill teaching with my colleague in Wisconsin. So the Farm Bill has provided a lot of help to the farmers, but provided they should understand that better. So we are teaching as an extension, extension educator how to get the benefits of the farm bill, how to get the benefits of social security. Many farmers uh, does not, are not getting the social security benefits. And we have been doing that program a lot. So those, as soon as the things are changing, we are working a lot in that area. Thank you, Subhajit, for your beautiful questions. And I really appreciate that. Back to you, Dr. Goswami. Okay. so. Um... I will officially now uh, close uh, taking questions further. Uh, I guess that there will be many other questions. You may, uh, I, I will keep all these questions with me and I will send it to Nav and Vikram as a souvenir of inquisitive minds. Uh, maybe they can interact with you later, uh, but uh, everything should start and end at uh, a point in time. Uh, so on, on behalf of uh, the uh, university, I extend my heartfelt thanks to Vikram and Nav for their participation, excellent deliberations, patient hearing and discussion. I extend my thanks to the audience for their patience and extremely important questions during the question and answer sessions. And uh, special thanks to Swami Paramahansananda and Shirshakji for setting up uh, the talk from the headquarters. And I also extend my thanks to my colleagues, Sanchaita, Supriya, Hiratan, for logistics and intellectual supports received during the preparation. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Deeply appreciate the opportunity and thank you all for participating. We are very grateful and indeed for your participation. Deeply appreciate it. Bye.